Rob, you know what that is? I'm sniffing. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I told you that was a bad habit. <laughs> that is an allergic cluck. Want to hear it again? Yeah. That's and, good. And we're going to talk about that. The allergic And so much more cluck. here on Podcast Pediatricians. I'm Matt Gotthold. I'm Rob Walter. And we are Podcast Pediatricians. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Tuned In, and Google Play. And, of course, our website, podcastpediatricians.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Today's episode is on allergic rhinitis. Very topical because that's all we're seeing in the office. Oh boy, yeah. It's allergies. Indeed. It's that time of year. So we're going to go through in our typical fashion from front to back the topic of allergic rhinitis. As our listeners know by this point, I really like to dig into a little bit of history first. And so we're going to go through the history of allergy. The origin of the word allergy is a good place to start, I think. It comes from a Greek word, alal, A-L-O-L. Alal. Alal. Alal in the conversation. Um, So alal essentially means a change in the original state. And so what this ends up meaning is that An allergic reaction is the result of the body's change when it responds to an otherwise harmless substance. The term was first coined by, and I've been practicing this, Clemens von Pick. Do you think I pronounced that the right way? No. Pouquet? I think it's Clemens von Pick. Pick. Or even Piquet. Piquet. Okay. We'll go with that. We'll go with Piquet. Probably the earliest report of allergic reaction occurred in King Menes of Egypt, who was reportedly killed by a wasp's sting somewhere between 3640 and 3300 BC. But actually, back then, there was a tribe called Mylantos, and they had a magical cure for bee stings, but they jacked up the price to many, many, (laughs) many bags of gold, and King Menes passed on it, and then he died. Egypt then destroyed the Mylantos tribe. But rumor has it that their legacy lives on. All right. Well, getting back to the real facts, allergy was also reported in ancient Rome. So Britannicus, do you think they named him after the encyclopedia? I don't know. know, He was the son of the Roman emperor Claudius, and he would develop a rash with his eyes swollen to the extent that he couldn't see where he was going whenever he was exposed to horses. Claudius was the emperor that conquered England and Britain. Mm. So you have to think there's some connection. Mm -hmm. And Britannicus was murdered before his 14th birthday by his stepbrother Nero. So allergies was the least of his problem. Some histories report that that dastardly king, Richard III of England, capitalized on his own allergy to strawberries in a cruel political fashion. He secretly ate some strawberries just prior to giving audience to Lord William Hastings, who was a political adversary, and then promptly developed hives, which he knew he would get. And then he accused Hastings of putting a curse on him and demanded and got, because he was the king, Hastings' head on a platter. So a strawberry took down the House of York and doomed the princes in the tower. Mm -hmm. Truly the story that Shakespeare refused to tell. That's right. (laughs) Did I tell you I'm reading Romeo and Juliet right now? Seventh grade, I think, for me. (laughs) When I read it. (laughs) It's a good one. Okay, so anyway, jumping ahead to the 20th century. Between 1911 and 1914, Leonard Noon and John Freeman laid the groundwork for immunotherapy with their research. So immunotherapy eventually led to allergy shots. In 1937, Daniel Bobbitt created the first antihistamine drug. And in 1948, Philip Hench and Edward Kendall discovered corticosteroids. And this paved the way for their importance in medicine. That would be the corticosteroids, not necessarily Philip Hench and Edward <laughs> Kendall. Who <laughs> but they're important. I, I didn't even know how to pronounce the second, second gentleman's name. These compounds are now used broadly to treat asthma and allergic reactions. Sometimes overused Indeed. in terms of steroids. All right, Rob, you got to help me out with these guys. Kimishigi and Teruko Ishizaka. Made great strides in our understanding of allergy when in 1967 they discovered the role of IgE class of antibodies as the principal mediator in allergic reactions. When there's an exposure to an allergen, like pollen, a person who experiences this who is allergic will make IgE antibodies. I have to say, I didn't realize that was only 50 years ago that yeah. they discovered IG antibodies. Even in medical school in mm-hmm. the 80s, the mm-hmm. immunotherapy part was this whole... Oh, they made new... it sound like it was forever. Oh, we've right. always known this. Yeah. Apparently not and now until it's... 1967. Now it's a center of almost everything, including cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. So these antibodies, the IgEs, 
attach themselves to mast cells, and with repeated exposures, the allergens cross-link IgE antibodies on the surface of mast cells, and that in turn causes other mediators like histamine and leukotrienes and others to be released from the mast cells, and this causes the symptoms that we all equate with allergy. Medical science continues to advance our understanding of allergy and the ways to treat it. As we start to talk about treatment, our disclaimer once again, we are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. Maddie? <laughs> so how common is allergy, Rob? In the U.S., it's estimated to affect approximately 60 million people. So allergy is present in 10 to 30 percent of adults and, according to some studies, almost 40 percent of children. The prevalence of allergy has doubled over the last 20 years. Allergic rhinitis is not a very common entity prior to the age of two or three, since it typically requires a few years of allergen exposure to develop. However, if a very young child has persistent nasal symptoms, then the diagnosis at least needs to be considered. Allergy prevalence increases in frequency throughout childhood and peaks in its prevalence by the teenage years. Predisposition to allergy, just like to asthma and eczema, is often inherited genetically. You know that absolutely. If both parents have it, I tell them to assume that baby Haley will be itching and sneezing in the fall and spring eventually. However, as you said, it's really not that common in infants. So I feel this question all the time when infants keep having multiple colds, which are normal. Could it be allergies? Could it be allergies? And I never like to say anything's impossible in medicine. And even if both parents are allergic, right. a nine-month-old, uh, 11-month-old is not having seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. They're having colds. They don't need allergy medication. Did you have a girlfriend in high school named Haley? No, have you used that word Haley? Uh, you know, this is like times? the third time you said baby Haley. I did not. <laughs> yeah. I did not. I'm looking for... Uh, like was a was she name. elusive to you? <laughs> How about... You thought about asking her to the prom and you didn't? Maybe I'll go with baby Jaqueline. That, that would be nice. <laughs> baby Jaqueline. I think that uh -huh. hits, the, hits the right Very spot. nice. See Key and Peel. I do think that the term allergic rhinitis is kind of a boring name. We used to call it hay fever, although hay was rarely involved and you rarely get a fever with allergies. I kind of like ragweed fever hmm. or dust mite fever, mm -hmm. like Ted Nugent, like mm -hmm. dust <clears throat> mite <throat> fever. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> That may not uh, catch on. That's going to make the cut. Continue, Maddie. <laughs> okay. The economic burden of allergic rhinitis is humongous. In the U.S. alone, the estimated cost of treating allergy and its toll on our economy range anywhere from 5 to $9 billion a year. That's a pretty wide range. Anyway, that's the best information I could find. Allergies don't just make us completely miserable, but they affect sleep, cognitive function, physical performance, and really overall the quality of life for many people. Yeah, definitely allergies are increasing, and it may just be for our quest for a germ-free life. The hygiene hypothesis that we'll get back to kind of explains why allergies are going up, but also the increased carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has a role because rising CO2 means increased pollen-producing weeds that love the stuff. Increased CO2 also favors deciduous trees over less allergic conifer trees, another reason why allergies on the rise. I don't believe all that global warming stuff. <laughs> alternate facts. <laughs> so let's talk pathophysiology here. Well, through a complex process, certain cells process proteins, which we encounter in our environment. This processing eventually leads to some other cells, B cells, to make specific IgE antibodies and also increases the proportion of other cells called eosinophils, neutrophils, and mast cells. The IgE antibody specific for a certain allergen or protein, because that's actually what allergens are, then binds to receptors on mast cells and creates sheer misery for us. There are two main reactions going on here. The first is the early reaction, which results in sneezing and runny nose and develops within the first 30 minutes or so of exposure and then disappears. The other is the late reaction, which is what causes nasal obstruction about six hours after exposure to allergens. This involves infiltration of the nasal mucosa with inflammatory cells like the eosinophils and neutrophils and T lymphocytes. And this mess is slow to dissipate. Do you have, do you have allergies? Do I have allergies? Eh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll do a little allergic clucking at home before my wife tells me to knock it off. <laughs> I had terrible allergies growing up. And I, I remember walking home from elementary school, just like a faucet, just ah. like water just dripping down my nose, my eyes itching, just running back to get into the house. <laughs> How did they tell the difference between it was that and you're <laughs> drooling? <laughs> 
So I'd run into the house, not drooling, but dripping, and get into the air conditioning, and then just spend the rest of the afternoon watching Dark Shadows and Batman. Because Dark, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Uh, Barnabas Collins, yes. right? Very good. Uh-huh. I wasn't allowed very to watch good. that, but I snuck a peek every once in a while. Didn't know they had mm-hmm. that show in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For most people, nasal obstruction is the main symptom of allergic rhinitis. Traditionally, allergic rhinitis is subdivided in, by the kind of allergens or allergic producing proteins and into seasonal or perennial types. So seasonal allergies are caused by outdoor allergens or pollens. In the U.S., windborne pollen from trees and grasses are prevalent in the spring, and weed-produced pollens, particularly ragweed, is common in the fall. Interestingly enough, flower pollens hardly ever cause any issues with allergy. Did not know that. Fun fact. I just looked it up. Perennial allergies are typically caused by indoor allergens, such as dust mites, animal dander, fungus, and cockroaches. Dust mites are a major allergen and a major cause of chronic allergic rhinitis. They love warm, moist, indoor environments. Kind of like Rob. They can colonize pillows and mattresses and carpets. (laughs) And under a microscope, they look like the creatures that live in Rob's sneakers. Animal dander consists of dead skin flakes from common household pets, particularly cats and dogs. People can also be sensitive to the proteins in an animal's saliva and the animal's urine. Cockroach allergy can be a huge problem for people in urban environments. Children with perennial allergies often have less dramatic symptoms than those with seasonal allergies. However, their symptoms may include recurrent ear infections, frequent colds, snoring, mouth breathing, fatigue, and nasal speech. Let's get back to the la cucaracha you mentioned. Because over the years, so many studies have come out talking about pieces of cockroach, and it's just disgusting Mm -hmm. how much cockroach pieces are all over everything, especially in urban areas, including in all of our foods. Just want to mention. Didn't you just allude didn't you just allude to the germ theory wherein we're getting way too clean? What do you care about a cockroach leg? I don't like cows and goats and farm animals in it, but I don't Uh, want cockroaches. It's all natural. Okay. So how how do we diagnose this allergy how do we, how dilemma? How do we diagnose this? Let me tell you, Rob. Matt. So diagnosing allergic rhinitis is usually based on history, occasionally with the use of diagnostic testing. Classic symptoms of allergic rhinitis are rhinorrhea, essentially a runny nose, sneezing, nasal obstruction, and nasal itching. Allergic children also often have symptoms of postnasal drip, cough, tiredness, and irritability. They tend not to blow their noses but instead prefer to sniff and snort and clear their throats. Many children and adults will demonstrate an allergic cluck. Nice. Just thought you didn't know where I was going to fit that in. Wherein they create negative pressure in their mouth and use their tongues to essentially scratch their itchy palates. Now, you mentioned based on history and also diagnostic testing, Mm -hmm. but obviously this is one area where the physical exam Oh, yeah. Is more important than many others like constipation Mm -hmm. to really lead you down the pathway towards allergy. Yeah. And and, and a lot of kids who are allergic essentially declare themselves from the jump. So there are multiple physical signs of allergy in children. Probably the most common sign is referred to as allergic shiners. These appear as dark discoloration below the eyes. Allergic shiners are caused by blood pooling under the eyes as a result of nasal and sinus congestion. And it's obvious because that's the area of your body where the skin is actually the thinnest. There's another entity called Denny's lines. That's D-E-N-N-I-E-S lines. And these are the extra folds that many allergic kids have in their lower eyelids. And the parents have the same exact folds because they they're all yeah. suffering together. You can kind of see it coming. An allergic crease is the horizontal line across the bridge of the nose, which comes from repetitively performing the allergic salute. So this is a well-recognized maneuver, this allergic salute, in which a child will sniff and sweep up with the palm of their hand toward the sky across the bottom of their nose. This simple exercise is an attempt to either open nasal passages, wipe away secretions, or relieve the nasal itch that comes from allergy. Now, we don't have video yet, Matt, but I want to just see if you think I'm doing a good nasal salute. Ready? Go for it. Ready? (laughs) Are you going to wipe that stuff off your eyebrows? <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> it's a very efficient move. It's April. It's April. I have allergies. And as we said, it opens the nasal passages, wipes away secretions, and relieves the itch. And it accomplishes all these things with one fell swoop of a move. It's brief, but it's efficient. 
In addition to all these signs, some things that are seen on physical exam include pale and boggy nasal mucosa, oftentimes with a watery, clear discharge. Nasal turbinates are structures inside the nose which project into the nasal passages like ridges, and the turbinates help to warm and moisturize air as it flows through the nose. The inferior turbinates can block nasal airflow when they're enlarged, and in allergy, these things oftentimes become huge, oftentimes to the extent that they're basically obstructing the nasal flow. So, Matt, do you routinely look at the nasal passages on your exam? You bet I do. Do you have a separate little scope that, that hooks on to like the Welch Allen thing that they sell? Or ah, I'm not buying into that. Yeah, I don't do mm-hmm. that either. But I do make it, like even my non-allergy exams, I always look up the nose. I do too, yeah. Because oftentimes it's, it's a bit of a tell for multiple things, allergy probably being the most prevalent of them. But uh, it's not uncommon for us to uh, occasionally find things that a child has put there. But that's for another... That's for another podcast. You know, yes. fun, fun things we find in ears, noses, and otherwise. But related to allergies, the other thing we see is evidence of past nosebleeds or epistaxis. Yes. And yes. that's another sign of spring. The flowers come up and mm-hmm. kids are coming in with nosebleeds. Yeah. And you look at those raw anterior septums mm-hmm. um, and that could be treated Vaseline or even mupirocin ointment and gentle nasal saline to prevent future nosebleeds. I don't know if you've ever done this, but when kids are having nosebleeds, I like to ask them which finger they use to pick their nose. Now, even the teenagers, I say, which finger is it? And they and I don't, but, but, but which finger is it? And finally, they very sheepishly push up their index finger and like this one. Mm. And then I always follow that with the answer should be, I never pick my nose. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <you. laughs> You've got a cruel streak, man, but we talked about this before. And the other saying I always like about in this area is you can pick your friends (laughs) and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. (laughs) I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Nice. A a gift from me to Uh, you. Thanks, man. After a short break, including Matt's new tech toy recommendation and a little podcast pediatrician genealogy for Father Matt and the Sound of Music, we'll be right back with more allergic rhinitis. Okay, we've got some random things to talk about. Matt, you really want to talk about some product? Yeah, so I I just recently, I guess I've had it for about a month now, but um, got turned on to a little device that I have in my car made by a company called WizGear. And I think it's actually, it's a magnetic attacher for your phone. And what you do is you, this comes with this little almost soft claw-like thing that you can put into your, your vents. And it has a pretty high powered magnet on the front of it in a circle. And then it comes with a really super thin magnet that you attach to the back of your phone. Uh, I actually use it under my iPhone case, so between the case and the magnet, and it works beautifully well. And you can position it up on your dashboard to keep whatever you need to be seeing at stoplights up there and prominent for you. So whether you're using a GPS whether you are between driving um, when you're at a stoplight or a stop sign flipping a, a, you know, onto a different music or hopefully a podcast, I just found it to be great. And this is one of those things where I got one first and then in a turnabout, then, my kids really wanted it. And I, I think I shared this with you, Then I? I got uh-huh. it. And again, I, hopefully people are clear what this is. It's, it's, it's a clip with a magnet on top that's round and you clip it on your vent right next to where you're driving and then... The magnet goes in the case, or it can be back of your phone, or it can go. Mm-hmm. We put we both put it in between our case and our iPhone, and it just sits up there. And then you can use it if you're using it as your GPS. Obviously, you're not texting while you're driving, but Mm-mm. I do use my phone sometimes as my GPS, and that way it's right there and it's yeah. it's not blocking. And every car has a vent for Matt's. It's kind of behind the steering wheel. He used it. Yeah, in so my I actually put it. Prius, I actually, it's on the right. Yeah. Your, your rocket ship. My rocket ship Prius. <laughs> but I actually attach mine to part of the uh, odometer because it also has a little protuberant uh, ridge there that I can just push it onto. And so you just, you pull it off, you, you place it on and it just kind of sucks it right in there. I love it. And it's cheap as heck. I think that I got two for, was it nine ninety nine Rob, or something like that? Right. Yeah. You know, Matt, on Amazon? I got that too. And Matt uh-huh. showed me this first. We were driving to the airport actually going someplace. So he showed me this and I thought that was really cool. And it was six... Six in the morning, mm-hmm. freezing out in the mm-hmm. 30s. Mm-hmm. And we got out of the car mm-hmm. to get to our flight. 
And then Matt comes around and shows me his red Crocs. And like, look at my Crocs. Look how cool this is. I'm like, Matt, I'm freezing. And then he looks at me and he goes, where are my you keys? You said you weren't going to bring this up. <laughs> and he locked his keys in the car at 6 a.m. And so I had to climb over the railing to go to the guy who uh, was in the booth and took the money. And I said, ah, we, we don't have our keys. And the guy's like, that ah, happens all the time. People come back from vacation and they don't have their keys. No problem. I'm like, no, we haven't even started the vacation. We're, we're, and our we're... plane is leaving in an hour. Uh, and my It was a working friend, vacation. We go into a right, conference, right? right? On podcasting, actually. I'm going to give myself credit here. and then Because <laughs> then Matt said, you know what? You go on. I don't want you to miss your flight. And I'm like, no, if we can't go together... We're oh, not going to go. What a buddy. And thank you to the uh, parking people at Philadelphia. Uh, they probably don't get enough uh, praise, but they came in and they broke into Matt's car. They did, very easily, I must say. Uh-huh. You know, kind of disturbingly easily <laughs> that they broke in and we got our but keys. It was funny. Didn't you say that the guy said, like, when you told him that I locked myself out of the car, he's like, yeah, yeah, we get that all the time. And they got on the phone. He's like, yeah, we got to lock out. <laughs> <laughs> which, which means we got an idiot. Here That's right. In uh, Philadelphia. Um, so That's why I, I sent you over. <laughs> so I don't have a product, but. I have kind of felt over the month that there's been an elephant in the room of something Matt told me that has to <laughs> has to come out. So Matt told me about his relative who got a genetic test recently. <laughs> And he's been really squirrely about this. I'm, put, I'm putting him on the. I'm putting him on the line here on the air. Oh, so, what was the genetic goodness. test that uh, she got? So, so it wasn't actually her. I think it was another relative of ours that she had spoken to, and they got. I think one of the. Um, gosh, what are those tests called? Like 22 and Me or 23 and Me yes, in yes. type of thing. Where we'll tell you what your genetic background is, and so my my cousin's kind of talking about. You know, so it looks like we're this percent this, and we're this percent that, and. 18% Eastern European. And she just kind of leaves this pregnant pause, like I'm supposed to say something. I said, uh, uh-huh. And she says, well, you know you know what that means. I said, no. She said, Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, but Rob's locked right into that oh, now. I did, you know, <laughs> It explains so much. Like, I think people who listen to this notice that the person saying oy vey a lot is not me. It's the Catholic boy across from me. The who, Irish Catholic. Uh, yeah, Irish weren't you German an altar Catholic. boy? I was an altar boy. It was an altar uh-huh. boy. And not only does he say oy vey, but yeah. he says it really well. And very... In fact, I seriously would have considered being a priest if they could marry because, you know, I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't give up the marrying side of my life. Uh-huh. But, so you anyway. know, I had that in my back pocket. But nice. then we started talking more Sprung about because you know that uh, I talk about Broadway a lot. So finally, Matt talked about that he was on the stage once in his life. <laughs> and I said, so what did you play your one time you were on the stage? Oh, my God. And it was, uh, what did you play, Matt? I'll let you tell the story. I, uh, so our, our senior play um, was, was The Sound of Music. Love The Sound of Music. Love uh-huh. it. Although, you know, Edelweiss, that song? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, mm-hmm. Ever see Man in the High Castle? It's about the Nazis take over. It's kind of ruined, ruined that song oh, for no. me. but. All right, mm-hmm. so you were in Sound of Music. I was in Sound of Music. Thing. And, and Who'd you play? <laughs> well, I wasn't the nun. <laughs> I, I played Rolf, Liesel's boyfriend, who was a, a Nazi. Nazi. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So 18% Eastern European. What was the, what was the other German part? I'm so good. This, no, wonder I'm so, no wonder I'm so conflicted. <laughs> no, and, and I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, on one of the, uh, there were two casts and we each played two nights. And on one of my nights, I forget whether it was my first or my second, after, after Rolf finishes singing, um, you are 16 going on 17 to Liesel. He runs away. He runs off the stage. I ran right into the side of the stage and like half <laughs> knocked myself out. <laughs> it was one of those classic like guys sprawling on the, sprawled out on the stage afterwards. And this is, this is where my children understand very clearly from my wife who went to high school and, and grade school with me for that matter, that daddy has no shame. <laughs> Cause or, it didn't bother me a bit. Or daddy's an idiot. Uh, well, they're, 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 that was so we also we talked about that. We also have that in common. Like he was on stage once. I was on stage only once. I would never do it again. Uh-huh. I was in Once Upon a Mattress and had one line that was it wasn't the P, <laughs> and it actually starred the star of it was an actual future Broadway star named Joanne Ports. Years later, I saw her in Once 
the musical, mm-hmm. and I didn't know she was in it until I was on the train Amtrak coming home. Like, oh, oh I, cool. I was on the stage. You go on the mm-hmm. stage in the beginning. It's a sad thing. But it's an interesting story that she was in that musical, and she was actually robbed of her Tony nomination by Adina Menzel hmm. behind the scenes. And evidently, it turns out that Adina Menzel, who's another Syosset-Tonian, does not like any of her fellow Sassetonians to have any Broadway success. And so she's undermined Natalie Portman, Tracy Pollan, Adam Pascal from Rent. Do you get like a People magazine Rob, for theater Sassi, goers yes, or something? And Sassi, Robert Mascio, who is the Todd from Scrubs. I love Scrubs. Oh, Scrubs are great. And, and she's even undermined Judd Apatow, the creator of the best series ever, Freaks and Geeks. And by the way... That wasn't the best series ever. Before. It was. If no, I was in no, Freaks and Geeks, no. I would be a geek. I would be wearing Star Wars clothes. So Shocker. Just, just to say, there's a lot of Sayasa drama that swirls around uh, Broadway. What do you think is the best series ever? Well, someday we'll talk about it in, in detail. Oh, so, no. Uh-huh. It starts with J? Uh, it does start All right, with we'll, we'll J. leave it at that. You can think about what series yeah, starts with J. That, I think that FX Matt series it starts with J. With. Oh, definitely obsessed, obsessed with. with. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, that's our little break. We'll be right back. Many children with ongoing problems with allergy have elongated faces, referred to as allergic faces in the business of medicine. Not only are their faces long, but they often have a high arched palate and they can have dental malocclusion. And my perfect picture of this, at least, is Cameron from Ferris right. Bueller's Day Off. Yep. Long face, miserable looking dude. He had the classic allergy look. Do you remember who played him? I don't. Alan Ruck. And no, I don't know this the way you know these things. I looked this up. So Alan Ruck, he also played Stuart Bondick in the sitcom Spin City alongside of Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Mm-hmm. So I have- oh, who replaced Michael J. Fox? You should know this, Mr. Oh, TV he, guy. Oh, he got Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. Don't remember. The infamous, and I use that word in all of its glory, Charlie Sheen. Mm-hmm. I, sh- I should have remembered that. You're right. But I have to say, I'm looking over what you just said, and I feel like you've gotten kind of personal because I have chronic <laughs> allergies. I have a high arch palate. I have an elongated face. I had Check braces. out, Ron. I had braces for seven years. So are you kind of calling me miserable looking? Because I feel like I'm more of a Ferris than a camera. All I can myself. say is check out Rob's mug on the website. <laughs> You'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> miserable looking. Uh-huh. So back to the exam. Yeah, let's go back to the exam. <laughs> Tonsils are often enlarged from the constant irritation of allergy. There's often evidence of middle ear effusion. Many children demonstrate a phenomenon called cobblestoning in the back of their throats and this is one of those things where you know what when they named this it was perfect because that's exactly what it looks like it looks like little cobblestones in the back of somebody's throat and for us as pediatricians oftentimes that's one of the only tells that we have if somebody is having a chronic drip this cobblestoning is a consequence of a constant drip 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 it's like snotty water torture going on back there and the body's reaction to it is by forming small bumps or cobblestones from hyperplastic lymphoid tissue in the back of the throat Matt I completely agree this is such a specific specific finding for me to separate out from viral colds and I often try to show the parents what it looks like so they can see that physical finding that's very specific for allergies. Don't forget, have the kids say eh, not ah, if you want to see that back of the throat really well. Cobblestoning is the single finding that just clinches the allergy issues for me. Yeah. So there are other associations too. So another really important point is that allergic rhinitis often occurs in association with several other diseases, particularly asthma, allergic conjunctivitis, and eczema, or as it's also known, atopic dermatitis. A fact that most of us were taught in medical school is that there is a triad of allergic diseases consisting of allergic rhinitis, asthma, and eczema. We were trained to recognize that if one of these three miseries is present, that we should diligently be on the alert for the others. So let me see here, other famous triads. So if I say Larry, Mo, you say? Shemp. Shemp. Oh. <laughs> or Sh- Curly. Oh, Curly. Shemp loses. I really Curly like Shemp. was the guy. Okay. Shemp didn't have his own shuffle. <laughs> Curly had his own shuffle. <laughs> Very <laughs> true. How about if I say Crosby, Stills, and? Nash and Young. Nash <laughs> That was a quad. That wasn't a triad. Did I ever tell you I went to a Neil Young concert once? No. Yeah. Well, I, I've been to, to many, many concerts, but this was the only one I actually fell asleep in. 
And it had a lot That's to do with sad. the fact that, well, no, 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 there, there were extenuating circumstances. So I was in the very top of the, of the Philadelphia spectrum and the weed smoke was as thick as, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a forest. And I just, I, I wasn't a smoker. And so it just kind of zonked me out. My friend woke me up in the middle of the encore, which I think was <laughs> Cinnamon Girl. Uh, Great sh- song, but I missed the rest of the show. <laughs> well, I went to a Grateful Dead concert in D.C. Ooh. once. I always love telling that to my uh, mm-hmm. teenage patients. That legitimizes and you. Did not fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Um, the woman in front of me almost peed Why, on me. why did the LSD my... keep you up? <laughs> no. She almost peed on my foot. It was a very, very uh, oh, that's interesting not nice. uh, crowd, but it was it was great. Yes, when I have an infant or a toddler with eczema and wheezing episodes, which is not that uncommon, I tell the parents that hopefully the wheezing and the eczema will fade over time, but it's very, very likely that the child will have long-term seasonal allergies. And if that's all they have when they're 20 or 25 uh, and not having wheezing and bad eczema, that's a pretty good outcome. Yeah. There wasn't, wasn't there a paper stub published a few years ago that essentially said, you know, hey, look, if, if a baby has moderate to severe eczema, it's not a matter of if they're going to have asthma. It's just a matter of when. Boy, I, I don't know if I believe that 100%, but it seems to be the case a lot of times. That was Great. a very, very telling paper, but it certainly fit into the whole triad you know, type of a concept here. So anyway, back to the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. Seasonal allergies are often diagnosed simply by history. Spring or fall rolls around and the child starts to experience the typical symptoms of sneezing, runny nose, sniffing, and coughing. As mentioned previously, spring pollens tend to be from trees and grasses, and fall pollens tend to be from weeds, particularly ragweed. However, allergens can vary widely depending on one's region. Clinical history is also important when there's an obvious and consistent association between an exposure and symptoms. For instance, hives, stuffy nose, and or immediate sneezing every time Uncle Lester's cat sits on your lap at Thanksgiving could definitely be a clue that something is up between your immune system and the cat. And as a general rule, cats are worse than dogs for allergies. And rabbits are worse than everything. Really? I didn't know that. That's my general rule. (laughs) Did you guys ever have a rabbit at your house? Never did, but I read someplace that they're the most allergenic of all the all the pets. I have a rabbit at my house right now. Do you? Do you know why? Well, my daughter's a kindergarten teacher, and it was her turn to take it home for the weekend. So it was quite the scene trying to sneak that thing in and distract my two Labrador retrievers and not let them know it was in the basement. We'll see how that goes. Stay that would, tuned. That would be a, be a tasty Stay. snack for your Labrador retrievers. Well, it would disappoint the kindergartners, yeah. that's for sure. they got to learn about yep. the circle of life, I'd say. <laughs> Oh, not that way, hopefully. (laughs) There are some other helpful tools to diagnose allergy. And so in the past, and we're going to go a little historic here again, nasal smears were frequently done to identify eosinophils, a type of white blood cell commonly seen in allergy. Did you ever do a nasal smear to look at eosinophils? No. Okay. I'm reading this like, I'm not that old. I was your residency. You never did nasal smears, but go on. It's the day you weren't there. (laughs) Go on. This This is in these things, in these smears, usually a patient would blow their nose into a plastic wrap or into wax paper to collect the evidence to be examined. As I was thinking of this, I, I've, been, I've been known to use whatever's lying around really? the car. Yeah, <laughs> like, a, like a Tasty Cake wrapper. <laughs> Once an Ikea wrapper. Uh, I was kind of desperate to use an Ikea uh, receipt. <laughs> of course, this made it impossible to return the uh, Fernkigdag or whatever that, that word was. Those, those, those Swedes go nuts with the Ikea names. I just can't keep up. I just like the Swedish meatballs. They are. You know what's the... Here, we're going to talk for a second about my favorite things. You know how we do that every once in a while? Uh-huh. One of my very favorite things in the world is the fact that you can buy that, pardon my French, kick-ass bag at Ikea for a dollar. That is priceless. I can't tell I mean, have you used those bags for things? The Ikea bags? Yeah. No. Oh, I keep two in my trunk at all times because you can literally, like, I've literally hauled wood for that when I've been camping. I have used it for any number of things, and they're huge, and they're resilient and they're sturdy and they're only a dollar and i think if you grow up in the pine barrens of new jersey <laughs> having you learn to use your resources your to carry multiple heavy things and at the last second even probably uh, a good idea it's where, it's where we put the squirrels we shoot we don't want to know we don't want to know anyway So what else can be done here? Well, serum quantitative IgE levels are also used sometimes. So just to review our our immunology here, there are basically four major types of antibodies, IgG, IgM, IgA, 
and IGE. Did you notice I went out of order there? Because the way we learned it, at least the way I learned it, was G A M E, like game. So high IgE levels suggest allergy, but many people with allergic rhinitis have normal serum IgEs. So this has limited utility. How else can we help diagnose allergies? Well, skin testing is commonly done. This can detect antigen specific, which means actually protein type specific. IgEs, so that one can identify specific allergies in patients with an unclear or questionable diagnosis or those who need management beyond just the routine things. Radio allergy absorbent tests or RAST tests are also commonly used. And now I think the newer RAST test is the immunocap, mm, which is supposedly yes. better than the RAST test. Have you been reading again? <laughs> nice. These tests can detect antigen-specific IgEs when a diagnosis is in question or the severity needs to be determined. These are more costly to do than skin testing and have lower degrees of sensitivity. They can be helpful if they're used efficiently. Do you use these very much? Do, do mm, I used to. Do you, do you send kids for RAS tests or immunocap anymore? I Honestly, I almost always use it exclusively when I'm trying to look at food allergy. I don't really use it for environmental allergies. And you know, even those, I don't. We'll mm-hmm. get food allergies, a whole different subject. Oh, but that's, that's going to be worth at least an episode false or positives mm-hmm. and false negatives. There and there's, are. New, there's these new component tests the mm-hmm. allergists do for those. Oh, so for peanut, yeah, I've heard I about that. I really don't do blood tests for allergies anymore. I, mm-hmm. I, history, physical, yeah. if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, mm-hmm. I just treat it. Well, not to get too deep into the food allergy thing here, but the way that I'll usually address this is if a parent has a question as to whether or not a child's sensitive to a food because they either consistently broke out in hives or something else happened. As an infant, I'll usually wait until the time around a year of age when we do some other lab work screening. For instance, here in Delaware, it's mandatory that we screen the for lead. lead. Exactly. We'll usually throw a, uh, a CBC onto that. And that's the time when I will order a cap rast for strawberry. You know, or something along that line. And that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, it's not a knee jerk reaction usually for most of us, at least the way that um, my colleagues and I practice. So, and by the way, as we get into talking about uh, getting the skin testing, which we often send to the allergists, what do you think about ENTs who brand themselves as allergists and then do skin testing and allergy shots? Yeah, I, there's, there's just something that doesn't sit right with me on that one. I mean, there are people who are fully trained, fully board certified allergists. And to me, folks who try to do this as a, almost like as, as a second job, I just don't have the knowledge base that allergists do. And so it, it gives me pause. And when my patients have seen folks who do this, it always makes me a little bit leery of the diagnosis because the practice of allergy is it's a bit of an art form in the sense of how do I know how to interpret my results? And um, I just, I'm a little leery of having somebody whose main thrust of practice is a, a, another specialty dabbling in something that honestly there are full-fledged specialists to take care of. I agree. Although we have some local ENTs who do this and they're pretty brilliant and I have, I have no doubt that they have the knowledge base, but it still rubs me the wrong, wrong way. I yeah. think what really opened the door for them is when the oral immunotherapy was not FDA approved, but was available mm-hmm. cash only. Yeah. And our local allergists wouldn't give it because it wasn't FDA approved, but the right. ENT stepped in mm. and gave it just like they did in Europe mm-hmm. and um, got a big market share from that. Have you ever considered doing allergy testing in your office? No. No, you know what? I mean, it's flashed through my brain from time to time, and I just immediately the brakes go on, and I say, this is just not my area of expertise. You know, given the fact that we feel that way, especially with the fact that we, we have a children's hospital five minutes away from us, and we still are leery about doing this, I think really speaks to the fact that I think allergy belongs in the hands of allergists. I agree. We could do it. We probably could make a profit doing it, yeah. but had never had any desire. And you mentioned about the, the hospital, but allergy also is one area where the community allergists... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For these type of things, mm-hmm. really stack up just fine against the you bet. children hospital base. In fact, they're I think they're more used to dealing with the everyday allergy issues than sometimes mm-hmm. the hospital based uh, pediatric allergists. And I had another question for you. Yeah. When you have a patient who you you're sure a duck is a duck, it's an allergy, you want to treat it, and they just want to see an allergist. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Well, you know, what I try to explain is what are the criteria, at least, that I use in terms of trying to discern whether a patient needs to see an allergist or not. And and those criteria are generally things like, one, I have no idea what's causing this certain symptom in you, but it looks allergic. Two, this is really a stumbling block in your life. I mean, to the extent where you're just miserable with the way this is going on, and what I think is probably going to be down the line for you sooner than later is consideration of immunotherapy. 
because clearly things aren't working out for you. Allergy shots. Exactly. And then three, if I think that there's something potentially life-threatening here, and I really need the expertise of an allergist to point the family in the right direction, either because they're not buying into that idea or because I just want all the I's dotted and the T's crossed for this child's care. And that goes along, obviously, with asthma also Mm -hmm. on the same rules. But, you know, number four ends up for me over time is if the parents just insist on it. Yeah. If they really want to go, and I don't think they need to, I certainly will be fu- say fine. They can go. Mm-hmm. But to, to the reality is these days is that we get dinged on it. The mm-hmm. insurance companies will grade us less and we'll probably get less reimbursement because mm-hmm. we're using specialists more. But right. I'm not going to tell a family that they can't go to an allergist if they no. want to go to an allergist. Okay, Matt, did you ever have a patient self-refer to a specialist for no particular reason or ridiculous reason? And then worry that the specialist thinks you're an idiot because you sent them there? I really used to worry about this when I first went into practice. I was on the verge of calling the subspecialist multiple times and say, like, hey, look, I, I didn't send them there. I, I know this stuff. Believe me. You, you know me from the hospital. You help. You help. I, I'm dead to that now. I mean, at this point, I just figure, hey, listen, I care what the subspecialists think about us. And I think if they know us well enough in our community, they realize that a lot of the folks who self-refer just pass go and, and, and skip us and move right along to them because they want it done now as opposed to doing any dance with us first. Right. And plus, we have enough stupid referrals that we do anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we don't want extra credit for that. So they know That's us. That's right. The extra um, credit. So speaking of specialists, I had this uh, thing I've been holding back. But a few years back, a pediatric subspecialist in our community that Matt and I both know very well, who might not be our favorite, had said to me that he wondered why I went into general pediatrics because I seemed a bit too smart to be an office pediatrician. So I think he... I would never say that to you. (laughs) I think he thought he was giving me a compliment, but my actual first thought was how happy I was that he did not go into general pediatrics and stayed in his narrow subspecialty field because he could never handle the breadth of knowledge of a pediatric generalist. And plus, for this particular person, the parents and families would have eaten him alive in private practice because if you don't have good interpersonal skills... And if you can't read people, then you're not going to survive with families, True. 30 families a day. True. So, Matt, do you think that you are dumber than most pediatric subspecialists? What? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, no. I, I, you know what? I toyed with the idea of becoming a pediatric subspecialist, but frankly, nothing really struck my fancy to the extent that I wanted to do it exclusively. You know, I really love what we do as as general pediatricians because we can really do what we want to do up to a certain point. And if we feel like we're in over our head, now we're in the catbird seat here uh, where we practice because there is a children's hospital, you know, literally right. a few miles away. So, But we can see all the things that we want to see and take them up to the limit of our uh, experience and comfort level and then refer them on. But I am very uh, glad that I decided not to subspecialize. But on the other hand, I'm very glad that others did because we need those folks. They're a critical part of what we do. And I think we're both glad about two specific things. One is that we never have to go to newborn deliveries Mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And number two is we don't have to deal with press gainy scores. Patients don't like us. They'll, (laughs) they won't go to us, but so many of my subspecialty colleagues get dinged because they get a bad press gainy score. But sometimes you got to be brutally honest with a family and getting scored by it, I think is not a good path to good pediatric practice. Right. I mean, people aren't always going to like what we say. Big business for this press gainy, whatever the companies do it to gather all these statistics from the families and then score you and then your bonus is based on that. So Mm. really happy we don't have to deal with that. All right, so now we have one shameless plug aimed at our pediatric practitioner listeners. So you parents out there, this is really isn't aimed at you. We both will be at the Hot Topics and Pediatrics Conference in Disney World at the Grand Floridian from July 27th to 29th. as a Thursday through Saturday. I'll be moderating some and giving a short talk while Matt will actually be in the audience learning as much as he can, <laughs> which frankly, he really, really needs to do. I find myself knowledge starved <laughs> at that time of summer. <laughs> Yes, I do. Touché. All right, so we're uh-huh. going to be in Disney World. So, Matt, what's your favorite ride in Disney World? Oh, I, I will say, first of all, I've only ever been to Disney World once. Oh. So this is going to be my second run. I'm not a huge Disney fan. I'm kind of more of a mountains and lakes guy. So the first
first time I, I went, it was kind of kicking and screaming, and my family still knows that. But I said, okay, well, let's wait till our youngest is old enough that he'll remember it because I'm out after this. <laughs> so I got conned into going back again this year. But when I will say that when I was there, I, I got to relive probably my earliest memory. So the earliest memory I have is being on the It's a Small World ride at the World's Fair in New York State in 1964, I believe it was. Right. Rob knows because he was about 25 then. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just see the animatron people and that slow lilting tune. And, and it really took me back when I was down there and, and took that ride. Of course, my kids thought it was <laughs> boring as hell, but I really got to relive. I, th- I was two at the time. And it's the very first picture I have in my head from my childhood. That's so weird. We didn't mm-hmm. talk about this. That is my first earliest memory. I was maybe a year older. Of me being in It's a Small <laughs> World. <laughs> I saw you there. No, You're I was- a creeper. My parents took us in the car. My sisters were in elementary school. I was in nursery school or something. And I remember being in the car and we went to one of their schools and then they kept going. And we were looking like, you missed the school. And we're like, we're going to the World's Fair. Ooh. So they played hooky. We went to the World's Fair. I remember I had a monkey on a stick. Mm-hmm. Weird. I guess that was a thing back then to have a monkey on a stick. I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe for Long Islanders. I, I, yeah. In Jersey, we usually put corn dogs on sticks. <laughs> and it was great. So I went to Disney World the first year at opened in 73 we stayed in the polynesian i loved it's a small world but the one i loved the most at the time was it the haunted mansion oh yeah and at the end the, the guy ghost is sitting next to you and in 1973 that was <laughs> that was high tech. edge technology yeah. there's nothing and back then you used tickets mm-hmm. so there was no bracelet you, it was like a carnival and you had tickets huh. and there was no one place where mickey was so you'd be walking and someone yell mickey's in tomorrowland and then everybody would run to try to see mickey <laughs> or winnie the pooh there was no rhyme or reason but it was kind of random and kind of fun that day no so, it was putting homing devices on mickey at that point huh? so as much as we like disney and we'll go to some of these Disney like things. Disney. Mm-hmm. While we're there, I think we're going to have to take Uber over to Universal to go to Harry Potter's World of Wizardry. Now, I've hmm. been there already, mm-hmm. but uh, you'll love it. All right. I'll give that a shot. I'm not buying your wand, but you'll <laughs> love it. So, Grand Floridian, just 209 a night. Such a deal. And to be clear, it's run by Nemours Foundation. And I do get a small fixed stipend for doing it, but don't get a penny more whether you attend or not out there. <laughs> We are looking forward at that conference to the premiere of something called Hot Controversy Mini Debates, which I hope will be like point counterpoint. Remember Dan Aykroyd, Dan, oh, Jane yeah. Aykroyd, yeah. Jane, Jane you ignorant, ignorant mm-hmm. something. We're going to do Should You Kick Out Non Vaxxers from Your Pediatric Practice, which I think we'll also do on this podcast in season two. And we'll do Should You Ever Use Protein Pump Inhibitors for reflux in infants. And that latter debate will include the infamous poop guru, Dr. Carlo DiLorenzo. And as you can imagine, it's always cool and breezy in Orlando at the end of July. No heat waves ever, but we always have fun. So Google Nemours Hot Topic Pediatrics Disney World for July to check out the talks and see if you might want to join us in Florida. And stay tuned for allergies part two in our next episode where we'll detail treatments for allergic rhinitis. Say goodnight, Matt. <laughs> By the way, I don't receive a small stipend. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just hanging out (laughs) with the family. (laughs) Good night, Rob. On 17, fellows will fall in line. Eager young lads and fruways and cats will offer you food and wine. Totally unprepared are you to face a world of men. Timid and shy and scared are you Things beyond your care Podcast Pediatricians Productions All rights reserved